Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Urban Legends Bloody Mary, released direct-to-video in 2005. While I grew up watching the first two Urban Legends, I had never seen this threequel before deciding to cover the series. All I knew was that it was direct-to-video and suddenly supernatural, a pivot to the early aughts trend of J-horror, which made stringy, long-haired ghost girls all the rage. I was surprised to learn this movie's not egregiously bad, at least for a low-budget horror film made in 2005. It still sputters out in its third act, like many slashers, but at least it's coherent, unlike the mess we got for Final Cut. Bloody Mary was written by Michael Doherty and Dan Harris. Mike Doherty's the man who gave us Trick or Treat and Krampus, as well as Godzilla King of the Monsters. What I don't understand is the timeline here. This came out two years after X-Men 2, which Doherty and Harris also wrote. X2 was fucking huge. Was this an old script from before they made Bank? Or was this a fun little project to do before they went and wrote Superman Returns? Why is this movie there in their filmography? Their script is mostly unrelated to the first two films. It follows the spirit of a murdered high school girl from 1969 who kills present-day teens in ways that evoke urban legends. The suddenly supernatural sequel and high school date rape revenge elements remind me of two other slasher sequels that were much more solid. 1999's The Rage Carry 2 and especially Hello Mary Lou Prom Night 2, one of the greatest what-the-fuck horror movies ever made. Like that film, this features a girl named Mary from a bygone era whose spirit gets vengeance on the people who wronged her. If only this were as interesting as Prom Night 2. There's just not too much that stands out in this third urban legend, aside from it being a nice time capsule of 2005. We're talking tanning beds, t-shirts over long sleeves, and lines like this. You gonna hook up that one chick? The one with the big tits. <laughs> oh, yeah. It takes place and was filmed in Utah, though we don't get enough of the location's flavor for my liking. Give us that Salt Lake seasoning! Director Mary Lambert is a steady hand who helmed the original Pet Cemetery and its sequel, but her work here feels uninspired. Too many dry scenes of characters trying to figure stuff out. Whatever though, Lambert directed the music videos for Material Girl and Like a Prayer. She don't have to prove shit. Also, it doesn't help that most of her cast are first-time actors and models. A few people do alright though, including a 21 year old Kate Mara, and the gore is surprisingly pretty good. Because of YouTube changes, I still have to blur that gore even with a sponsor, but I'm still happy to talk about today's sponsor, Raycons. Just let me walk off set to do it because of, like, production schedule issues. Don't worry about it. Oh, hey there. I'm James from the future. Or was he James from the past? Huh. Something to think about. Regardless, I'm here to talk to you about today's sponsor, Raycons? Where'd my Raycons go? Well guys, it's been weeks, it's been hours, but every moment that I'm not enjoying my earbuds, eight hours of charge time and 32 hours of battery life in the case, it, it feels like an eternity. And I know what you're thinking. With Raycon starting at just half the price of other premium audio brands, why don't I just buy another pair? Which I have, but my Raycons and I have been through so much together. Their comfortable noise isolating fit has been my partner during workouts and doing yard work outside. Their seamless Bluetooth pairing has made it easy to switch from work mode to game mode on the fly. And their ability to switch between three sound profiles plus awareness mode or isolation mode with just a tap made them perfect for any environment. Even Stonehenge. I guess I'll just have to accept that the- wait a minute, I'm having a memory flashback. <laughs> well, this is embarrassing. But hey, at least Raycon has a free 30-day return policy for that new pair I ordered. Get a pair for yourself by clicking the link in the description. Or go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. I've heard of an urban legend that will propel your YouTube videos forward. Let's get to the kills. Let's get to the kills. Let's get to the kills. The movie begins with a title car. Oof, really? That's the font you're going with? It's 1909 nice in Salt Lake City. Not that we'll get to see much of it. A chick named Mary Banner is standing there like a weirdo when she's joined by her friends and their lettered jack off dates. Can you imagine having 69 on your varsity jacket? I would have been insufferable. The dudes get date rapey in a hurry, doing a roof job on the punch, which the ladies drink down until they're being escorted outside to the Predator Mobile. Mary quickly realizes what's happening as Queen Dawn of the Homecoming teases her. 
Do you think he would ever touch you? I mean, he literally is right now, Don. Mary kicks this dude Willie in the willy and escapes back into the school, choosing to hide rather than return to the very public dance. Willie corners her in a back room and tries to write off their drugging as merely a Mary misdemeanor. It's just a little prank. Dude's ideas of pranks also extends to face punching, which knocks Mary into a desk and cracks her head wide open. When she's unresponsive, Willie cleans up the killie by stuffing her body into a trunk, collector style. More than 30 years later, Mary's fate is told as an urban legend to Sam Owens by her friends Mindy and Martha, who just wandered off the set of Slumber Party Massacre. They're here instead of at the homecoming dance because Sam went after the football players in the school newspaper. Maybe if you weren't always speaking out, like in the school newspaper, Maybe we'd have dates to the homecoming dance. Sorry ladies, Zoe Barnes always got to get the scoop. Since Martha's actor is doing such a good job here, they let her give us the perfunctory urban legend definition. An urban legend is just a made up story that people keep telling as if it was true. They mention the pop rocks and soda thing, like you gotta, and then get to the titular tale. Say Bloody Mary's name three times and she shows up. That's not even a real urban legend. That's just like that movie, Candyman. Um, actually, Martha, you have to say Candyman's name five times for him to show up. A uh, thank you! Oh, back to the pillow fights. Okay, ha, <laughs> you gals. When they finally pillow themselves out, they go to sleep. Though not before Sam recites Bloody Mary's name three times. And there she is, with someone putting their hand in front of the camera? Were they testing focus? Later that night, while the girls are dreaming of missed high school musicals, someone approaches and scares them opening the door. The next morning, they're gone! It worries Sam's mom Pam so much, she starts dissolving all throughout the day. And what a shame, after she woke up in such a good mood, sharing fun homecoming stories with her son. Something tells me you didn't wake up naked in Tijuana. Just because there's a dead Mexican hooker in my room doesn't mean I went to Mexico. Haha! <laughs> Wait. What? This kid, who's sure to grow up with issues, is Sam's twin brother, David. He's already an outcast at school, and having a missing twin sister doesn't help. The jocks seem to know what happened to Sam and her friends, and thanks to this teacher, we know which jock is in charge. Mountain gorillas live in groups, ruled by a dominant male. The head ape is spiky-haired, chin-strapped Buck Jacoby, and he and his bros definitely had something to do with the missing girls. Sam returns home that night, first in a reflection, which is a nice touch. But she's unable to remember what happened to her and her friends. They say they woke up in an abandoned mill on the other side of town, and blood tests reveal that they were roofied, but not abused. The sheriff says not to worry. Could be the girl's idea, but... Practical joke? Yeah, I'm sure that's it, dude. Whatever happened, Sam's getting spooked by mirrors now, with Bloody Mary visiting her to make sure she does her homework. Come on, Mayor. Sam's already getting harassed in school by her younger sister, Rooney, in her first ever speaking role. My mom says that it's all stunning. They did to themselves. Yeah, well, my mom says the Nightmare remake wasn't very good. Sam confides in David that Buck and his bros had lured them out of the house, saying that they wanted to talk about the article she wrote. Next thing they knew, they were in that warehouse. David confronts the guys the next day at school, but they probably shouldn't have done it in their home turf, dude. Yeah, man, no shit you're getting pinballed out of there. One of the Buck bros, Roger, visits a strip mall tanning salon since this is 2005. The girl there, Betsy, is eager to jump his bones, but before he dives into those low-rise pants that definitely don't have butt pockets, he's gotta get his melanoma on. Never forget. He settles in for a long sesh when I Will Always Be There by Nikki Harris starts playing. It's the song that was playing when Slick Willie tried to take advantage of Mary, and it'll be her entrance music throughout the film. The heat goes up as Betsy's phone convo goes on, and by the time she smells something smoking, it's too late. Rogers become the last hot dog on the grill, a shriveled little charcus in the tanning bed. Wait, what the fuck urban legend is this supposed to be? Sam gets her homework dropped off off by Heather, who used to be a childhood friend. But now they're in different social groups, with Heather dating two buck buck, who's also an abusive fuck by the looks of it. Heather still defends his actions to Sam. Look, what happened to you was just a little payback prank and I had nothing to do with it. Wait, wait no, roofing someone isn't a prank. Man, all these people suck. David knows. Don't defend her, Sam. She felt bad. She was cool about it. That was being cool? Heather did drop something else off along with the homework. A letter she got that gives Sam scary flashes to Mary Banner's murder. I guess that letter marks Heather as the next victim for our favorite brunch cocktail. And her urban legend-inspired death will come in the form of a CGI spider. Which honestly doesn't look bad 
bad, considering this movie's year and budget. Heather wakes up with a spider bite she thinks is a pimple. And if you know this tale, you know we're about to get the grossest popping video of all time. Well, second grossest. <laughs> It starts with a Battle of Geonosis style zooming on her face as a spider comes out, the first of oh so many just crawling below the surface. Her face is soon covered in copy and pasted CG spiders, which spread to her body and pretty much all over, until she's smashing her face straight through a mirror. It leaves two glass shards sticking out the top of her head, and the only thing Heather can think to do is peel her fucking face off? Holy shit, this is disgusting! Wow, I did not expect this movie to get me like this, but Heather's death is so certainly a solid one. Mark Villalobos did this movie's special effects makeup and had previously worked on the wonderful Uncle Sam. I love all his work on actress Audra Leah Kenner here. The bloody meat of the fake face she tears apart looks great. I'm sad so much of it wound up getting covered by digital effects in the film. Same with the spiders. They had an orb weaver spider wrangler on set, but I can't spot any real looking ones in the movie. At Heather's funeral, Buck glares suspiciously at Sam and David. He thinks they've killed Roger and Heather and says as much to fellow football feller Tom. He tells Tom to meet him that night for more just a pranks bro, but Tom ain't gonna make it if he keeps seeing ghosts in the road. Holy shit, was I seeing things? Well if I wasn't, I'd better soon. All those road beers are burning through Tom's bladder, but when he goes to pee on an electric fence, Nikki Harris starts playing from his truck, signifying that he's about to get fried, which is apparently an urban legend, I guess. Bloody Mary turns the power on, sending a shock through Tom's dong and giving this town a corpse the EMTs won't soon forget. Holy shit. Shit, this guy's dick is smoking. Ha <laughs> ha, smoking! Sam keeps seeing Bloody Mary, as well as flashes of what happened to her in 1969. It worries her brother, mom, and stepdad, Bill. Stepdad Bill's been hovering around, a mayoral candidate who seems to have the support of the police, but not of David, who can't stand the guy. Inside the envelope that Heather gave her, Sam finds a very notated article about Mary Banner. She realizes that what happened to Mary is the same thing that happened to her. Only I'm still alive. The next article shockingly places this movie in the same universe of the first two. Which is weird enough, but doubly weird because the article's headline and text references the first movie, Brenda Bates' murder spree at Pendleton University, but David's dialogue reads something entirely different. A professor at Alpine University kills his own students using urban legends as his MO. Which is of course a reference to Professor Solomon in Urban Legends Final Cut. I'm not sure what happened there, but in any case, I'm reeling that this supernatural movie takes place in the same universe as the grounded first two films. I just didn't see that coming. To investigate further, the Wonder Twins head to the school to use its internet search. There, they find the names of Mary's two friends who got roofie pranked. Gina Lotnick died by suicide back in 1982, but Grace Taylor is still alive, so they look her up to pay a visit. They're scared out of the school by Buck's dad, Coach Jacoby, a sinister looking dude. No wonder, since he's Don Shanks, who played Michael frickin' Myers in Halloween 5. Shanks also appeared as the zombie fisherman killer in the fucking abysmal I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer, God That Movie Sucks, and another supernatural threequel that surprises you by taking place in the same world as the first two. What the fuck? They get to Grace Taylor's house, who's a pretty stereotypical hippie chick. You know what I mean. She's all about that ganja. Ha, <laughs> David, of course you're a fucking square. While Sam asks Grace for details about what happened in 1969, David finds artwork and scrapbooking all about urban legends and the incidents from the first two movies. Professor Alpine University kills his own students using urban legends as his M.O. Wait, what the fuck? That, that's the same line from earlier! A professor at Alpine University kills his own students using urban legends as his M.O. I I'm assuming that line was recorded in post, so maybe the first time we heard it, it was another reading they accidentally used as V.O. over the shot of that newspaper? I don't know, man! It's fucking bugging me! <laughs> Grace tells them that the ghost of Mary Banner is behind all these recent deaths, saying that the victims have been specific targets, the children of the people who wronged them in 69. For instance, Heather's mom was Dawn, the mean homecoming queen in the opening. Mary wants revenge on the five people who took her youth. So she's taking their children. Yeah, that makes sense, except for the whole five people thing, which she had already mentioned once before. There were five of them, including that devil bitch Dawn. Who was the fifth person? We only ever saw devil bitch Dawn, Willie, and Willie's two friends who were with Grace and Gina. There was never a fifth person. Fix your script! They figure that Roger and Tom's dads were two out of the five, and find out from Buck that his dad, Coach Jacoby, was another, which is why Sam saw him putting flowers on Mary's grave earlier. In fact, Buck got the roofie print idea directly from his dad. Since he might be in danger, Buck decides to leave town with his dog. Let's go. 
We gotta get the heck out of Dodge. Oh man, this movie's acting. He winds up in a motel somewhere, living the life. He's got his dog, his 40, his scrambled porn. You made it, Buck. He makes sure to get his hand licked to plenty by his dog, meaning we're doing this urban legend again. All right. Unlike in Final Cut, this time the legend happens for real, since Buck indeed wakes up to find his dog cut open in the closet. A bloody note says people can lick too, as can Pokemon. Nikki Harris starts playing, pretending another urban legend, the tale of the blue ball and scrambled. Family. Bloody Mary jumps from inside the TV to under the bed, then claws at Buck and crawls across the floor at him. She breaks his arm and then this bottle, across his face that is. It becomes 40 ounces of freedom from life, since Mary uses it to slash and stab him to death. Lilith Fields played Mary Banner, both out of makeup, like in the opening, and as a vengeful ghost. It took three hours to put her in makeup, and another to take it off at the end of each day. But Fields was pumped for the role. Horror films are the only genre where, like, little girls can sometimes be the most evil thing. Thing, so it's been fun. As a ghoul, Mary's befitted with creepy contacts, nasty veins, a silicone gash from when she hit the table, and an oozy mouth thanks to black food coloring. It turns your pea green, just so you know. News of Buck's death spreads through school the next day. Four down. One to go. Who was the fifth person? <laughs> Sam keeps seeing flashes of Mary, including one that shows she was still alive when Willie put her in that trunk. I stand by where I put my kill graphic, though, because she never got out of the locked case and eventually died inside of it. That's why it's her little ghost town. Even though David doesn't believe in the ghost theory, he still heads to the school to find more information in the archives. Oh, dude, you're knocking over the archives. He goes through pictures from Homecoming 69, uh, don't Google that, and matches a picture of Mary's date with someone in the yearbook. Holy shit. Holy shit! He comes home to tell Sam what made him holy shit his pants, but she's left and gone to Grace's house, now that she knows that Mary's body is in a trunk somewhere. David ends up getting attacked in his home, and killed via suffocation with a bag. And his killer was none other than- oh, not gonna show us, okay. Sam asks Grace to drive her to the school, even though Grace is scared and, honestly, probably in the middle of a green out. Eventually she relents and takes Samantha and a shovel there. Sam breaks in through the window while Grace waits outside in her van, thanks to some helpful supernatural flash. Ashes, Sam quickly finds the room where Mary died. You know, like 35 years ago. Nobody ever did any spring cleaning back here? Come on, people. You gotta have your ghost inspections at least once every five years. She finds the trunk and breaks through the hidden Mickey lock with a crowbar and some supernatural help. Inside, she finds, well, no surprise there, the dried remains of Mary Banner. Real fucked up way to go if you think about it. Sam tucks the skelly in nice and tight with a little blanket and carries it back outside where she sets it down on the ground with the loudest of clanks. <laughs> Clearly that is just a bunch of plastic bones. I found her. She finds Grace unconscious, having smoked herself to sleep, so it's up to her to drive this van out of here when David's killer arrives. She gets away and drives to the cemetery, giving her stepdad Bill a call for no real reason other than plot. Speaking of plots, she reaches Mary's grave and starts a digging, hoping to give this beauty a proper burial. The frozen ground slows her down, and eventually Bill arrives, asking to know what the hell is going on. After making sure she hasn't told anyone else about what she's learned, he shows her how to shovel with force. Samantha. <laughs> Yep, stepdad Bill is Willie, the date raping guy who killed Mary Banner by locking her in the trunk. He also killed David. Coach Jacoby was just a red herring. Despite Buck admitting that his dad had been involved, he must have been one of the other two dudes, or the secret fifth guy. Bill's trying to kill Sam when Grace finally wakes up and intervenes, but she's knocked out pretty quickly, allowing Bill to chase after Sam some more. Yeah, Sam, you've got a trip in these cases. Give the slow walking killer a fair chance to catch up. Wait a minute, slow walking? Ed Marinero was an NFL running back. I mean, I hear he was slow talking recently, but dude could run. She ends up getting the jump on him and thwacks at his head a couple of times, but he throws her off and knocks her out with a couple of kicks. He drags her back to Mary's grave, ready to win this Buried Alive match, but first he's gonna, jeez, freaking decapitate her with a shovel? Holy shit, Bill. All of a sudden, Nikki Harris pipes up from the van, signaling another visit from Mary Banner and her ghostly gams. She confronts Billy Willie, looking way less bloody than usual, until it's time for her to finally get revenge. As Sam and Grace watch, Mary grows a ghoulish visage, then spits out uh, bees? Green rocks? What the fuck's going on here? Whatever's happening, it spells the end of Bill Owens, and he's dragged beneath Mary's grave. You know, Sam and Grace, I feel like your reaction should be a tiny bit bigger. Did you not see what we all saw just now? The movie ends with a news report that spreads truth to the town. Mary Banner was killed long ago by Bill Owens, because that guy was a real son of a bitch. How many bloody bodies did Mary reflect onto the kill count? Let's find it. Molly, quit licking my feet. I gotta get to the numbers. Uh, Molly's right here. People can lick too! Uh, Zorin! No, man, that's so inappropriate!
What the fuck? We're gonna have to have an HR meeting now. Oh. I thought it was funny. Seven people died in Urban Legends Bloody Mary, with the victims consisting of five men and two women. Oh, man, did someone spill blue curacao in that Bloody Mary pie chart? <sighs> We've seen this count and break down three times before on the kill count, including just recently when Chelsea covered bones and all. With a runtime of 93 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 13.29 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Heather Thompson. It's got a little bit of wonky CG in it, but I still found it horrifying. Way more than I'd expect in a movie like this. Dolmachete machete for lamest kill will go to David Owens, cause I wasn't even sure if the old Black Christmas maneuver killed him at first. And his sister doesn't seem to care that he's gone at the end of the movie. And that's it. Urban Legends Bloody Mary came out in 2005 and is probably one of the lesser seen movies we've covered on this show. Next week, we're getting sticky with it since we're looking at Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Yep. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on a movie you've probably not seen. But go check it out if you're, you know, you're fucking if you got some time to waste, fucking throw it on, laugh at some shit, it's fine. It's all good, man. Thanks to Zorin and Chelsea and Molly for being in the little to the numbers bit. To her credit, Molly's a lot easier to get on camera than Lucy. Kinda have to clear the room for Lucy and you get her for like two takes and that's it. Molly, you just pick up and it's like, whatever the fuck, you know? Also, I tried to do the internet search joke like Cody Ko does the buttons voice. If you don't know what I'm talking about, search Cody Ko the button. It is one of me and Chelsea's favorite things to watch on YouTube. I want to thank some patrons like Nicole Pereira, Kyle Elrod, Soth Ark, B Doy, Kelly Rafferty, Chase A, Jacob Watson, Luke Egdeman, Chris, Christopher Rigby, Haley Latko, and Brad Denning. Thanks everyone. Be good people.